Today we have a webinar that's focusing on winter market opportunities in China. This is one of several webinars that we're going to have on China leading up to our trade missions that are coming up in December and March, which I will talk a little bit more about those at the end of this presentation. But for now, we have our host today, Josh Halpern. He's Executive Director of Getting to Global. Getting to Global provides companies with the resources they need to grow their business through exports. Prior to getting to Global, Josh was the founding director e-commerce innovation lab at the International Trade Administration and was a foreign service officer in Beijing. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Josh. Thank you, Maria. It's great to be here. Um, hello, everyone. We've got uh, a lot to get through, so we're going to rock and roll here. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, we're going to dive into is really the, the basis of this, this webinar is ways to incrementally go into China, predominantly uh, B2C and some of the feet, some of the issues around that and, and some of the experiences uh, and lessons learned. Uh, we also have Jeff Unze from Border X talking about uh, his experience and what he's seeing in the trends uh, in, in the snow and winter uh, lifestyle space in China, uh, and then also some of the, the things that he's doing in this space. So first, I'm just going to uh, introduce a little bit about who I am, what I do, as, as per Maria's comments. Uh, I formed a, uh, an initiative called Getting to Global, where we offer free support for companies looking to expand globally, specifically through e-commerce channels. Uh, we have a number of partners from government to industry. Um, I won't bore you with uh, any more details around that, but we'll send the slide deck and also the recording of this webinar after the fact. Um, just want to touch base on a very wide kind of broad, spoke, broad scope here, uh, a global phenomenon, right? Why cross-border? Uh, if you're on this webinar, chances are you already know that, and we're specifically focused on why China. Uh, but just to highlight, you know, most people are not really uh, concerned as to where they're buying product anymore. Uh, they are buying it from other markets, right? And uh, in general, uh, they they buy them uh, at at great frequency. Uh, I'm not going to go too far into that. Um, but we've been uh, surveying with a lot of our partners, uh, the merchants that are selling online, and and most are really having having uh, facing some challenges or don't feel like they're prepared globally. Uh, in particular, many of you perhaps on this call have experienced any aspects of uh, this slide e-commerce platforms lacking the technology, the international orders uh, exposing the risk, um, you know, and a lot of different unknowns from duties and taxes, um, obviously fraudulent uh, uh, orders. Uh, there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle, and that's why today we wanted to talk about, it, it, on top of that, the China aspect is challenging given the tariffs and the trade war. Um, the last thing you want to be doing is, I think, messing around early on with some of these details. Uh, so my big mantra and everything I do and all the workshops I run is always incremental first, uh, reduce the risk before you increase spending. Traditionally, there was always this comment, especially in China when I was at the embassy there and CEOs would come over or heads of international and they say, well, my CEO decided we're going into China. Uh, we've got a, a budget, we're spending it, we're doing it. And, uh, and it was, you know, now more than ever, you can test uh, via marketplaces and other mechanisms before you increase your spend, obviously, and then you reduce your risk. Uh, so I wanted to share a story uh, around the marketplace play with a company I worked with called Concept2 and, uh, and a, a manufacturing uh, and sourcing agent that, that helped them as well uh, called I think, uh, something like Total Global or uh, Total China or something. Um, they decided to list their product first on a marketplace on Amazon in China. Amazon China no longer exists. Uh, they were pushed out by a little brand called Alibaba. Uh, they did have a store also on Tmall on Alibaba's asset there. But this was at the time where they had their own marketplace. And so the company Concept2 said, look, we don't even know if people want to row in China other than Dragon Boat Festival. Uh, so let's start to test this. And so they listed themselves on a marketplace. And they started to, obviously, through automatic translation on their listings um, and allowing for fulfillment direct from, from the US, uh, they started to see some sales. It was only then that they started to start to seed some of their products, still not available, per se, with inventory in country. But they started to seed their product with uh, some kindergarten uh, uh, schools and local government. And nothing says China uh, uh, key opinion leaders more than giving something to the government and having them say they like it. So they started to test that on the Bund uh, in Shanghai, if any of you have been there. Uh, then they started to see some uptick. And it was only then that they started to look at after-sales service and creating a team in China 
imbuing them with a sense of kind of affiliation and support for a rowing machine that they probably hadn't heard of six months prior. But as you can see through an agent, again, this company concept didn't set up an office and register themselves officially per se at that time, but they did work through uh, an in-country uh, support team because of course a rowing machine requires a lot of after sales uh, uh, support uh, when it does break. Um, but here's an example of a pretty heavy hardware product that you'd think, I don't know how you go incrementally, you do it or you don't. And they started with a marketplace and then they slowly built. And after that, they started to create an uh, optimizing website, payment gateways in country um, and other features. But really it started with a marketplace. And that's to me a, a really interesting takeaway. And a cross-border marketplace, I think, I just want to talk a little bit why cross-border um, as an incremental step. You know, Chinese consumers, as many of you know, um, you know, odd, in contrast to the thought about copying and everybody's copying from a manufacturing side, the consumers are more adept than we are at, at identifying fakes. I used to buy um, ski gear, and when I compared it with my friend's ski gear uh, that bought it from the silk market in Beijing over many years, uh, you knew it was a China silk market product when the zippers were broken, when there were holes in the pockets, and the Chinese would never, wouldn't touch that, especially the consumers that are looking to buy and that are, are strong long-term uh, consumers of your, of your products. But here they can tell the, the fakes and the real, and they feel like if you're buying cross-border, then you are getting the real thing. Um, asymmetry of expense or cost. A lot of people think, well, if I'm shipping from here, it's going to cost more money. Uh, but in actuality, in a lot of cases, it's cheaper. Uh, on the left is a product that's actually purchased direct from a website uh, from, in, in fact, Burberry um, in the U.S. on a cross-border website. Uh, and then on the right is the actual cost if you bought it from a distributor in country in Burberry. So again, price asymmetry is at play here. Um, and uh, they'd rather pay you know, less, of course, but even around the equivalent if they know it's the authentic or the real thing. The other is obviously more variety and SKUs. Uh, obviously, if you're not uh, selecting out a certain number of uh, SKUs to send to your distributor in country, you can offer the entire uh, gamut of, of product in the US from your US either website or from your US inventory as a direct to consumer play. Uh, so of course, uh, selection, which is becoming obviously a, a real big drive among the uh, affluent Chinese to want to see the same amount of product that they can see that they know their other counterparts in other countries can see. Um, and of course, for some of you, this may not be an issue, but certainly animal testing, uh, if you have maybe a winter hand cream or some of the cosmetics and beauty products, uh, but also some of the, the the, the other products that might come into play here. Uh, if you go direct to consumer, the individual consumer assumes the risk, which ultimately means you don't have to comply uh, with a large uh, swath of, of registration issues and certification issues in country that a distributor would. Um, so that's reducing your time to market, of course, and your overall expenses. Um, just a couple of quick things from, from my time in China. Um, that's me, I, I, you can't see a webcam, but I have a, little more, a few more wrinkles now. Uh, but that's me at a farm just north of Beijing. And to me, this speaks to uh, an issue around transparency and the desire for the Chinese consumer to know where it's coming from and ideally coming from somewhere else overseas. Uh, this is a farm set up by uh, a government official because he didn't trust the supply chain for food uh, into his uh, family and his, his, his kitchen. So he actually, he and other people got together and created their own farm uh, to actually fly uh, lamb and beef and other products in. Um, this plays though throughout, regardless of the product line, uh, if you can show more and articulate online through content, uh, through the fact that it's cross-border, that are, there are actually people uh, either making or handling or assembling or designing products in the US or elsewhere um, outside of China, uh, there is an assumption uh, that it's gonna be uh, perhaps of higher quality. And just to talk quickly around the Chinese uh, consumer, and I think Jeff is gonna talk a little bit more deeply around this, but um, there's a lot of misconceptions around the Chinese consumer. I would say um, uh, a lot of the things that have gone on in, in the US and elsewhere, uh, they've, they've taken on as well, and even Leapfrog does. Uh, they do have a, an emotional connection to product um, and, and where it comes from, who's, who's, who likes it. Um, another one, of course, is design, and they can pay really uh, strong attention to design uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, loyalty is one that's kind of uh, an interesting one because a lot of people talk about how Chinese consumer will jump around uh, to find the best price. They may not be as loyal uh, uh, to, to a company uh, if price difference is, is, is an issue, but at the same time, if, if it's a brand that they like, even if it's not necessarily a known brand, but it's a brand that they've just identified and like, uh, they will be loyal to that brand. They're just gonna find the best price for it. Um, 
and of course, there's other issues here. And of course, health is, is a major one. Healthy lifestyle in the in the lead up to the original uh, Beijing coming out party China, of the Olympics. And of course, in the upcoming Olympics, um, outdoor lifestyle is, is a huge one. Um, and so I think this plays really well into this. Um, and I've already talked about authenticity. Uh, real quick around IP, because how could we not talk about China without talking about IP? Um, here's a, a company that I was working with that does the aftermarket auto uh, uh, oils. And they found out their distributor had licensed their IP out from under them. And we went and sat down all guns a blazing uh, with our lawyers theirs. And at, by the end of the meeting, we decided that, that we should just have the uh, distributor continue because they're doing such a great job, but transfer the rights back. And there was, it was really a, a commentary on the um, pragmatism of the US company that they, they felt, look, it, it's still a better scenario and it's not personal. Um, as long as we're protected at this point going forward, let's keep, let's keep moving with the right distributor. So I, I know that there's a lot of probably, uh, it, it's pretty um, uh, a charged topic, but I, I always caution people to be more, um, a little more pragmatic. Uh, and the other thing is if you're not in China, you probably still are in China. I remember when Burt's Bees called me up and, uh, and they were looking to get into China. And I said, well, your, your code of already on sale in China. And if you have a brand that's, uh, that's desirous in China, chances are you're being sold there. So being proactive uh, is a great uh, solution because otherwise you're still gonna be sold there through gray market. And we can talk about that at another point. And just the last thing on this would be the Chinese consumer. Uh, email campaigns don't work because Chinese don't really use emails. I even work with IP lawyers over there that will ask me to send the actual document signed through WeChat. Um, so uh, marketing campaigns are really important uh, to, to, to work with local uh, in-country support. Uh, I think Jeff will talk about this a little bit too, but these marketplaces are key for getting in front of uh, consumers. The other is that uh, consumer feedback uh, is huge in China, of course. Um, if you want to understand the Chinese consumer and drive uh, consumption, you have to help them support each other. Uh, traditionally, as you know, there's, there's a lack of trust in China post-cultural revolution and many other is issues around China. Um, so the people they trust is, are really the people that are in their tight community. And that happens often on WeChat and, and other uh, marketplaces with reviews. And the last is, of course, they pay more attention than we do to um, expiration dates on packaging. Um, if you have a product that does expire, uh, don't take it for granted that they'll just believe that it is fresh. They usually uh, are predisposed to think that they're getting screwed uh, because they're getting the excess inventory from uh, other markets that uh, were left over. Uh, so making sure you articulate the, uh, the the expiration dates and know that it's fresh and new and, and uh, is, is helpful. Uh, the last one, Airbnb, when they came over to China, I remember meeting with them and, and they they sat there for about an hour or two and didn't really say much and listened. And that was something very different than a lot of other companies I talked to um, in, in going into China, uh, where they're trying to express what they want to accomplish in China. And I just caught, I just kind of, I think it's important to listen. And that's why we are here today. And I appreciate everybody who's here because they're already listening, especially because I think you're all on mute. So you, you have to, I guess, listen. <laughs> Sorry about that. But later, please ask questions. Uh, now, I'm going to get into Jeff, and he's going to talk a little bit specifics around the uh, winter market in China and, uh, and some of the things he's seeing. So I sat down with Jeff and uh, I was just asking him, you know, why do you love the Game of Thrones? And he's like, guess what? I have a slide deck to show you around this and I think we should talk. So I said, all right, you're such a dork, let's do it. And there he is. And I'm gonna, I think he's unmuted, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Jeff, you're up. I am unmuted. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I am a Game of Thrones dork, though disappointed with the ending like everyone else, I'm sure. Um, I think uh, China's a unique market in that it's one that five years ago, winter sports were virtually unheard of other than a couple figure skating and uh, this sort of desire. Uh, today, it's become uh, one of the top markets in the world, and it's growing very quickly. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. I'll talk about in the context of uh, skiing in particular, but it does apply to other winter sports as well. Let's see if I can get my forward. Let's see. I'm not sure I'm able to advance here. Josh, could you advance? Oh, there, there we go. So um, obviously, as many of you know, the uh, China made a hard push to get the Winter Olympics in 2022. And their slogan to do so was to put 300 million people on ice and snow. Um, 
it's a it's a very ambitious goal to go from uh, where they were to getting 300 million people to actually enjoy winter sports but it really fits along with their national fitness plan and their idea to get people more involved in uh, athletics to get the population healthier in general so uh, the whole slogan here was really to get these 300 million people and the idea was they were going to open up the markets and really make china a uh, winter hub um, that was done, you know, about four or five years ago. I think the results so far have been pretty darn good. If I can move along here. See, Josh, if you can slide it up. Apparently, it's not uh, responding to my touch. So, um, this is an example of some of the development that's going on. You see those lodges going up right next to the, uh, looks like kind of like a bunny hill there, and a lot of people doing the snow plow. But uh, when the Chinese government does mandate something, put something in a five-year plan, uh, it usually does get done within China. You look at uh, what they did uh, you know, 20 years ago with uh, their railroad system. Uh, when they do put their mind to it, the, the, uh, one of the benefits of central planning is you can get things done fairly quickly. So public and private investment is just flooding onto the ski slopes. The goal is to open 1,000 new resorts by 2030. That's pretty pretty darn impressive. Uh, the, uh, there's a huge amount of people taking up skiing. I, in fact, uh, the, uh, I'll talk about it in another slide. Um, it has become one of the top 10 markets in the world. It is occurring in skating as well. Uh, there's been a lot of skate rinks opening up. A lot of uh, people have uh, really gotten into other winter sports, such as snowboarding as well. I don't think curling has made the uh, the big inroads that we uh, all hope it will, but uh, I think that's right on the horizon, especially when they realize there's an opportunity to win a medal there if they uh, if they get up to speed pretty quickly. Um, anecdotally, my wife is from Montreal. I'm originally a Minnesotan, so both my kids play hockey, and uh, you can really see in here in uh, the Bay Area we have a lot of new immigrants from China, and uh, I would say three four years ago. Uh, there was a few Chinese people in uh, who were doing figure skating, mostly women. Uh, today, we're about 50-50 at my local rink uh, with uh, Chinese kids, new immigrant kids, that first generation, uh, really making up a big portion of the hockey team, making up a big portion of the ice skating rinks. It's pretty impressive. Let me move forward here. There we go. Um, exciting progress already. Um, there were 197 million snow tourists for the 2017-2018 season. So we're already well on the way to 300 million. Uh, the revenue there is about 49 billion according to C-Trip right now. So some great inroads. It went from out of the top 25 years ago, now they're the eighth biggest uh, ski market in the world. Obviously, there's some uh, still some way to make up, but uh, given the size of the population and the government mandate, uh, people are getting interested in snow sports. I think they are have a good chance of reaching their goal by the Olympics, if not a couple of years after. Now, what does this mean really for brands? The good thing about this is foreign brands are still king. Um, the people who do snow and ski, that tends to be uh, the population that loves foreign brands. So there's a really good uh, overlap. If you look at the Venn diagram, it would be, most, uh, it would be pretty exacting. Um, China now is the biggest foreign travel cohort in the world. More Chinese people travel international than travel domestically. A lot of them go skiing in places like uh, Colorado or Utah or uh, a lot more in Japan seems to be the destination of choice for Chinese right now, while they do wait for their uh, uh, other resorts to get up to snuff or their domestic resorts. But when it comes to the products they buy for skiing and for uh, skating, foreign brands are still viewed as the quality products. 70% um, of the local market is really controlled by foreign brands. Columbia North Face lead the way, but you can make a strong case also that uh, uh, you know, brands like Arcteryx and Canada Goose are hugely popular. Uh, the China brands are becoming higher and higher quality, but they still have a way to go to be perceived in that same sort of view as uh, some of the U.S. and European brands.
Canada as well, obviously. So there's definitely an opportunity here for any brand that wants to go to market. And it really goes beyond the uh, jackets. Things like jackets and things like uh, snow gear, um, that obviously has the biggest market. Jackets especially because it does get very cold in Beijing. I think it's the same uh, latitude as uh, Minnesota. So they do have some pretty, uh, pretty fierce winters and a lot of China does. And so if they can uh, uh, look good and uh, look sharp in a Canada Goose jacket or Arcteryx or North Face, they're going to do so even if they're not involved in winter sports. But there are a lot of other opportunities for ski wear, uh, uh, different sporting gear, that sort of thing as well, as well as uh, items that you need for winter sports, such as uh, suntan lotion, hand cream, these sort of products as well. See if I can move on here. Oops, went the wrong way here. And apologies, Josh. It seems like it's a little. Now we're going the Sorry, wrong. If you hit the, the space bar, it should progress, or the arrows on your keyboard. But I'm going to do it for you. There you go. I am doing that, so it's uh. Whatever. Whatever. I know. Okay. Foreign brand sales, this is just an example. This is uh, from a data uh, system that we uh, subscribe to because it's very important. Our platform, we always wanna know what's selling within uh, China on some of the various Chinese platforms. And so you can kind of see that obviously the sales, here's Columbia over here on the overwrite, and it's just the number of items they're selling on one uh, platform, which is uh, Taobao Global. And um, you can sort of see the units. Obviously it is pretty seasonal. Uh, they have great sales in the winter, drops off a little, and then people start prepping again. Uh, there's Canada Goose up, up in the upper right. Canada Goose is, a, is sort of an interesting case. They were doing quite well. Um, uh, they actually, this is, this is one of the issues also, you know, you can tell it's very seasonal, but they were having a big spike. Uh, that precipitous drop also had to do with the uh, capture of a Huawei by Canadian officials. A Huawei official was captured by Canadian officials. And so China instituted a national boycott on Canada Goose. Um, apparently, their sales are coming back. They did have a big drip uh, or a big drop there, but uh, it took about six months for the uh, uh, Chinese consumers to go back to uh, Canada Goose, which is one of their favorite brands. So I actually think they're they're reporting uh, actually very good sales for uh, this upcoming fall season. But this is one of the dangers of uh, going to market sometimes. If you, have, if you have a foreign country in your name, sometimes you can get the blowback from the trade war as well. Um, once again, speaking to the loyalty that Josh spoke of, uh, I think Chinese people at the end of the day do love that Canada goose. They love that big bright logo on the shoulder that shows everyone that they can afford to spend $1,000 per coat. And so it is still a product that is in high demand. It just, uh, it just took a temporary hit there. And obviously there's uh, some North Face sold on a different platform that's really uh, Tmall International in their platform there. Once again, you can sort of see the spikes as, at the different seasonal times. Mm -hmm. Now, how do international brands jump in? Uh, obviously, some of these brands uh, have gotten rather large. Uh, Canada Goose and uh, some of these other brands really view China as their big growth market into the future because um, you know, China does have more billionaires, more millionaires than the US. They also have a population of about 300 million of people that uh, can afford Western goods. That's you know, 300 million out of 1.2, 1.3 billion. But at the same point, that 300 million is the size of the U.S. market. Um, they can't afford products, and very few of them are skiing, or very few of them are doing winter sports now. But now they have a reason to do so. So it is a good time to move in. What's the best way to do so? I shall tell you when I get to the next slide. Josh, I like that you just have a phantom, uh, phantom mouse over there that goes over mine when I can't uh, complete that. Um, Really, it's a five-step process. One, determine your potential because you really want to see where you are in the market. If you if you are going zero to one, you have no brand awareness in China. Uh, your strategy is going to be a lot different than if you have a lot of uh, uh, resellers who are buying your product in the U.S. and then selling in China currently, and that happens a lot. That uh, goes back to what Josh said about even when you're not in China, you actually are in China. Um, there's a number of brands I think that. Uh, start off 
just with people buying at outlet centers or buying from Costco or buying directly on your site whenever you have a 20% off sale. Uh, holding that product, in many cases, they put it into a container, ship it to China, and then sell it on their Tmall store or their Taobao store, rather. So it's quite a frequent occurrence for a lot of brands. Uh, those resellers are very cognizant of what brands are suddenly trending and getting hot in China. So you really have to make it a point to find out that information yourself. And it's not really as difficult as uh, one might think. Uh, next, choosing a channel, choosing a partner, managing concerns, and then moving on. And then obviously the launch. So next slide, moving on to, in terms of determining potential. Let's see. So there's a few different data points that you really should take. Um, you don't have to subscribe to a service like Mojing, like we do. Um, there's also a few others that have English interfaces, Kung Fu data, uh, web presence in China. There's a few different places you can get data on the different Chinese platforms and what they're selling and what's hot. Um, those are two companies that uh, I think are fairly reputable. There's a couple Chinese ones as well that are a little less expensive. Um, China traffic is a very important metric as well. So if you look at China traffic, if you just see, um, if you have a flagship site, uh, if you have a .com that, uh, you know, do some minor analytics of it, see how much of your traffic is coming from China. In this case, uh, this particular brand or this particular merchant had 10% of their traffic coming from China. There's a pretty good case that you're getting a lot of demand there if you're not actively marketing in China, but Chinese people are still coming to your website. And in many cases, they can't buy from your website directly because they may not have international credit cards. Uh, they may have a tough time to go uh, really uh, finding their way around the site. They, you may not ship to China. Uh, but uh, in many cases, they're just looking at what the resellers are selling it for in China, and then they're checking that against your price here in the U.S. to see if they're getting a good deal or not. China platform sales. Go on to Taobao. Um, you can check out some of these sites as well. And if you enter a username, um, it's a fairly easy sign up, especially with Google Translate. You can see how much of your product is selling on places like Taobao and JD. Uh, you can sell, see which of your products are, are hot. Those will be sold by resellers, or if you've entered into some sort of JV relationship, you'll see that. But that's also a good indicator of where you are in the market. Social media mentions is really important. I know many companies don't have a Weibo or a WeChat account. Um, but even if you don't have, and that's those first two logos is Weibo and WeChat, uh, even if you don't, uh, Download Xiao Hong Shu, which is that third one. Xiao Hong Shu is Little Red Book, or Red is what a lot of uh, uh, foreign companies call it. But it is a big influencer uh, platform where people uh, can talk about, influencers can uh, do short videos, write articles, talk about the brands that they love. Um, it's, I would say, the most popular of the influencer networks right now. Uh, their e-commerce isn't really strong. In fact, they're moving away from that, but their content is very interesting. It's all user generated, so it's a little tougher to control, but um, just to take a look, see how many mentions you have can be very valuable uh, to see how much- hey, Jeff, well, mm -hmm. Just a real quick thing. If you, if you don't have your WeChat or other things set up, you can set them up without having a business entity in China. Uh, you can always ping me or, or, or something after the fact, but uh, uh, you, you should look at getting your, your URLs set up, even if you can't uh, register your company just yet in China. And then you can start seeing some things. Very true. And it'll give you a good indicator as well. Um, there's other social media platforms. Uh, short video and live streaming are becoming very popular or are already very popular as well. But I would say that's a, you know, I'm giving you the beginner level of where to get started. If you want to go to Billy Billy and you want to go to uh, Yuku and some of these others that uh, uh, other social media platforms, I would say those uh, those are more intermediate level, but they are interesting as well. Um, cross border sales is a, a really interesting way to go as well. If you are doing a lot on cashback platforms like uh, Rakuten, the former Ebates, or e or Amazon, or even uh, uh, sites like Deal Moon chances are you're getting a lot of resellers that are buying from you and then bringing that product over to China. So take a look at that. Take a look at how much of your sales. If you can cross-reference your sales on these platforms to how much is going to places like Oregon and Delaware, where resellers love to uh, uh, send their product before they send it over to China, that can give you an even better indicator of what your demand is in China currently and what your sales are. Uh, current category data, 
Um, if you can find that out, look at your, uh, you know, all these uh, different tasks that you just did for your own brand. Do that with your uh, strongest competitors. See where they're marketing. See how much uh, traction they're getting as well. And then lastly, potential is back-end readiness. Um, like I mentioned, fewer than 1% of Chinese people have a credit card. So how are you going to allow them to pay for your product? Are you, do you take Alipay or WeChat Pay? Um, many Chinese people uh, don't have their own way to ship. So are you... Uh, allowing them to ship product uh, from the U.S. to China or Europe to China. If not, or if you have an expensive DHL sort of courier service, chances are they still may want to use resellers because it's so much cheaper. If you're charging them $40 and they have to pay uh, full duty, it's much cheaper for them to use a postal route with a reseller and just get, a, get product into country that way. And lastly, I would say, uh, customer service is hugely important in China. Um, Chinese people, you know, we've seen from our own platform, I think the average touch they make on an international transaction is about seven or eight. That's how many times they're looking for where the product is uh, during the shipping process. But they also do a lot of pre-sales as well. And when you talk to other Chinese platforms, including ours, um, sometimes I think as much as 30% of sales, especially during peak times, comes from an interaction with a customer service rep, where the customer service rep uh, pre-sale is actually giving them advice on what to buy, on what size to choose, or answering some basic questions that may prevent them to sell to uh, buy. So, you know, having that customer service element, reaching out to them via WeChat or in-app chat, um, even a uh, toll-free number is very valuable and very needed in China. Um, the next is really figuring out who you, who are your shoppers. And um, Josh alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, this is a little chart I use for a lot of the clients that we talk to, but it sort of breaks down. Right now, one out of five customers in China, one out of five e-commerce transactions is occurring cross-border. So it's people that aren't necessarily buying from a local platform where the product is stored in China, but people who are buying from an overseas uh, a merchant directly or an overseas platform. And I really break it down into two different, two different uh, uh, types of customer, a convenience customer and an authenticity customer. And that convenience customer is one that's going to want to shop directly from, uh, you know, say, Tmall directly, or they're going to want to go to, uh, um, you know, a Sephora.cn or whatever, if you have your own .cn site. Uh, they really want to, they don't mind paying a higher price. They don't mind uh, of not having the full product line uh, they don't mind uh, a little bit of authenticity risk. Really, they want that product in one or two days. They want it when they want it. Can't really blame them for this. A lot of us are this way with Amazon. We don't really look at how the pricing is. We just want uh, to use our Amazon Prime and get it here in two days. There's you know, four out of five Chinese customers and four out of five transactions is that. Um, on the other side, you have this authenticity customer that does love cross-border. And they favor authenticity over convenience. They don't mind waiting a, you know, five to ten days for product. They really want to make sure they have that authentic price, uh, those authentic promotions. They want that long tail product. And this is sort of goes to the evolution of the Chinese customer. Uh, it did happen before that, you know, it was enough to have uh, the hot bag or the hot jacket or the hot boot that everyone had. Now that brand is still important, that brand element, but now they may want that long tail brand that they could only buy maybe on an overseas trip. It's an extra level of show off or an extra level of status to not only have the brands that everyone desires, but to have it in that long tail product that uh, other people can't get or isn't as accessible for the market. Hi, this is Nancy. I'm Jeff's colleague. And just to, to kind of add on that point is that product discovery and brand discovery has become more important, more and more important, particularly to the cross-border shopper. So it's not even a long tail brand. Yes, there's long tail products within the brand, but also there's a ton of new, especially in, in the ski and snow industry, there's a ton of new brands that they may or may not be familiar with. And they're looking for um, a trusted voice. 
space, whether it be an influencer or from the brand themselves, that they can discover things that they did not know existed. So they don't know what they don't know and they realize that. So how can we help them discover this, um, discover these new opportunities and new brands in a way that they trust? I think that's something um, very big right now with the cross-border community. Yeah, it's, it's an important element, you know, as a cross-border platform ourselves, I'll just give you some insight. Um, we did a deep dive earlier in the year to see exactly who's buying what within our platform. And I mean, we're relatively small compared to a lot of China platforms, only about 10 million downloads. But we found out that over half of the products that were purchased uh, on our platform have only sold one or two items. So people really are doing discovery. They are really trying to find some really interesting things. So while you know, a good two thirds of our revenue came from these hot selling products and these trending products that people may discover. People really do want to find something new and unique. And it's, uh, you know, I think it was good validation for some of the uh, things that we do within our own platform and some of the things the other platforms are doing as well through influencer and product discovery and trying to make it easier for people to find uh, new and great products uh, from the US and Europe. Um, that convenience customer really, uh, they shop on a CN site, Tmall, Jingdong, other Chinese platforms. Um, they buy from resellers sometimes. The authenticity based, uh, they really shop from dot coms with VPNs if you block them. Um, they really uh, use US based uh, proxy shoppers. So Daigo is uh, what we call, they're called representative buyers. Think of them as sort of a, a Chinese student, maybe who went to UCLA to purchase a product. And then they uh, had the product, uh, those people buy it on their behalf and then ship it over to them. Okay, I'll move on here. All right. Sorry. Uh, choosing a partner. Um, I would say this is really a portion of where you are. You know, once you determine your actual uh, ability to sell, you know, how China ready you are, if you have to go from zero to one, you know, this is on a ski pole scale, zero awareness up to Nike, which everyone in China knows. So, um, you know, when you're when you're early on, I think using influencers going cross border or wholesale with a wholesale partner making 50 percent margin makes some sense. You know, just sort of you're figuring it out. You're testing the waters. These things can be relatively easy. I would say when you enter into a wholesale agreement, only do it on a per project basis. Never give someone exclusive rights to your product because you never know how it's going to go in China and how your product's going to take off. Um, then as you move on a little bit more, um, search ads, influencers, you, you still keep your cross border, but also go with some other platforms as well. Um, you've created some demand here. Your brand might be trending. You think about uh, maybe getting into one of these, some of these Chinese platforms that have a little bit higher uh, break-even point, maybe a higher initial investment. Uh, that's where it makes sense. And then obviously, as you get much bigger, it makes a lot of sense to start doing retargeting with IPNU, which is uh, one of, is the leading DSP in China. Uh, I would say still use cross-border, still use uh, uh, influencers all throughout this marketing spectrum. But I would say you really don't want to go that first step unless you uh, really have a lot of money to invest. You should think twice about really doing the big initial investment with some of the big Chinese platforms because it just might not make sense for you. Concerns, brand protection. I know we talked about this a little bit. Um, I love this slide just because it's hilarious. These people swear up and down, by the way, that the Trump name has nothing to do with uh, Donald Trump. So. This is just, they happen to name their toilets Trump brand toilets. So um, this is an issue in China. Uh, it's a reason why you shouldn't register your IP early on and, fit, and uh, really control your brand. I think Michael Jordan is still in a fight over Air Jordans because someone has a knockoff Air Jordan within China that may have settled recently. I know New Balance, 60% uh, of the New Balance shoes are sold to the uh, Chinese guy who jumped on that IP uh, before New Balance registered in China. So um, bad things can happen if you don't register uh, early, uh, especially when your brand starts trending. So I would strongly recommend that. Jeff, we've got four minutes. So just want to buzz through. I know you got a lot of great content that we haven't even gotten to yet. Okay. Got a few questions. Great, great. All right, keep going.
what's up? Uh, product I'll, product I'll, placement. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll just touch I'll, on this. This is, uh, I just want to point out Blue Nile with toilets, with dog food. You see this a lot uh, in China as well, where, especially on the Chinese platforms, you have to make sure that um, you let them know that you want your products placed with like products. You don't want your brand diminished through uh, uh, being sold on that same page or right next to dog food or a toilet or anything else especially if it's a high-end product or you're trying to uh, really uh, be a prestige brand. Oops. And we can move through this one. I know you touched upon that a little bit. And just move to the next one, please, Josh. Oops. I got it. I'll take care of the slides. It's, it's quick okay. Early. Yeah, we have a, have a weird leg here. Um, just a quick case study. This is a, this is a winter influencer um, sheet that just shows some of the influencer mentions on some of the platforms. Um, I think it's sort of interesting to sort of see the power of this. On Chinese social media, uh, Chinese people typically uh, consume four times more social content than we do, and they produce three times more. So um, they are very much an influencer in social media driven society. Next slide. Um, just a quick, oops, just a quick case study. So a lot of what we do is um, we do a lot of content and the power of content is really that number one, we're writing professionally curated articles that tell people what's worth buying. Um, but that content really changes and you can really enhance that by doing a few different things. Um, we do a lot of uh, creating localized content. We do a lot of product seeding to get influencers to try that product. We try to get them to do unboxing videos. But it's really important, no matter what platform you use, to realize that the more voices you have in the chorus saying the praises of your product, the better. Um, one person can be viewed as a paid gun, but if you have more than that, uh, it can really become a trend and get people's attention. Next slide. And this is sort of an example. When we write an article about a product, oops, uh, we went back one again. When we write an article about a product, um, typically we have an increase in sales. Usually it doubles, sometimes more than that. If we do that with an exclusive, we pair it with an exclusive promo, not only to tell people why it's worth buying, but why it's worth buying now, we get a, usually a 3x bump in sales. But if we can do an article, exclusive promo, plus UGC, user-generated content that's attached to that particular product, it provides social proof. And that's when we really see products taking off. So, you know, it's sort of a, it's sort of a progression that we've learned over the last five years. You know, the UGC with the professionally generated content with an exclusive promotion, you can get some really good impact on that, especially when you're getting uh, people to that consideration level when you're taking a brand from zero to one. Uh, I want to just take, we're, we're at time. I know we gave everybody 45 minutes. If everyone could hold on for a second, we do have some questions coming in that I think do pertain to a lot of other people as well. Um, so if you don't mind, one of the, and then we got a, just quick comments from Maria afterwards around the upcoming trade mission. Um, but I want to just uh, hit on some questions. First is uh, from uh, one of the, the members, trying to understand the opportunity for smaller brands. How important is a brand in the Chinese consumer purchase decision versus other factors such as customer service, technical specs, et cetera? Yeah, it's a good question. I would say the, you know, and Nancy, feel free to jump in here as well, but I would say the brand is more important. Um, I would say on the rebuy side, you do, you know, part of the brand is just your overall experience. People do, uh, if they know your brand and they trust it, they're willing to give you a little bit of slack on the customer service side because, you know, they know that that brand is going to be quality. They, they care a little bit less about the customer service side. If you're trying to have, uh, if you're trying to introduce people, uh, to a brand, and, you know, to clearly state that they're able to return it if something goes wrong or if they don't like it or if there's some sort of customer service they can rely upon, I think it makes all the difference in the world. Um, we find this with sizing products as well. We do a lot of work on our platform on sizing charts um, because, you know, people are, when, when people are going with a new brand, they really want to make sure that uh, if something goes wrong, you know, they're just not stuck with a fairly expensive, uh, relatively expensive purchase that they can't do anything about. Okay, great. Next, uh, well, actually, before we get into this next question, I just want to also, you were so generous in your time and your insights. We really didn't talk about your model real quick. 
Uh, let me try to sum it up. You tell me if I'm right or wrong. Uh, you have a marketplace that's cross-border direct. U.S. companies or companies from around the world, uh, depending if they're Euro Europe or U.S., ship products to your U.S. warehouse, and then you ship those products directly to the Chinese consumer from the U.S. or the U.K., for example. Um, and, and you have a marketplace where they purchase the products in China um, from basically your marketplace, but you turn around and purchase it from the U.S. consumer. Uh, uh, sorry, supplier. I did a crap job at that. Can you do it in like a minute? Yeah, that's basically it. We have two value propositions. The first one is we create demand through our content. So we write about 50 articles a day. We do a lot of user generated content on our own platform and also Weibo, WeChat, other things. We had about 100 million people in China read our content, even though we only have about 10 million on our platform. Last year, we had 100 million. So pretty good halo effect. The other side, once we actually generate that demand, we capture it through our technology. So when companies partner with us, they immediately can take WeChat Pay, Alipay, uh, which is how Chinese people like to buy. They immediately, we localize all, all of their product names. Uh, we have in-app customer service. We have a 60 person team that handles that for our merchants. And then uh, obviously we handle all the shipping. We're really best in class uh, uh, logistics through a new uh, cross-border e-commerce uh, shipping channel that China just uh, made a lot more attractive and since January. So we're actually okay. uh, doing a lot on that line. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't take really upfront fees. It's more commission on sales and a request for, for the company to invest in marketing exactly you or elsewhere okay. exactly That's it will help you do the market but really we're a market enabler plus we have this content piece that is uh obviously driving sales as well okay another question real quick um what's the market like for backcountry safety products in china like beacons and airbags um i have a comment around this i don't know if you have something to speak to i'll, I'll my my understanding is that a lot of the the companies that I work with also that sell equipment to the to support the infrastructure around um, uh, the increase in in winter sports and lifestyle are are expanding exponentially. Um, obviously, when China decides to build infrastructure and support around an industry, uh, everything rises. But maybe you have some specific comments around that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's as niche as it is in the U.S., and it's really a proportion of the people uh, who uh, like to do winter sports, the people who have the need for beacons and these backcountry safety things is relatively limited. That being said, um, you're seeing a huge trend in China of people doing mountain climbing and doing some of these more action-oriented sports that would require these particular products. And one thing about, uh, you know, Chinese people who do these sort of things um, they don't really skimp on uh, on products. You know, if there's a safety gear that they can use in order to, uh, you know, it, it's almost a status symbol having everything they need to go there. Um, at our company, we have a lot of China investors, and I meet them quite a bit. And I think out of the five Chinese investors we have, uh, at least four of them have uh, have uh, hiked Mount Kilimanjaro or scaled Mount Kilimanjaro. And, uh, you know, they, they love to talk about the adventures that they've gone on and this sort of thing. So I do think this is becoming a trend in China, especially amongst the, the more moneyed uh, Chinese people. And I would add the tribal is king to me in China. There's a lot of tribal effect. I used to work with the outdoor um, kind of off-roading uh, companies and they have clubs and, and groups and they're going out there saying, this is what I'm doing this weekend. And it's all about the tribe. And they talk about it online incessantly and um, not on, not dissimilar to what we do or anywhere else in the world, but definitely something to keep in mind. And that goes to the other comment around is, are, is there room for small companies? Um, and I think there's room for small companies if you can build a tribe uh, organically. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think, once again, that goes to product seeding and letting people know the value and that sort of thing and, and the power of influencers. You know, you, if you get the right person to start talking about your products and that's someone who's trusted, they don't even have to have necessarily a large following as long as they uh, um, have a trusted group that can then start spreading the message. Okay, I want to move real quick on um, to um, a couple quick things. Uh, if you ever, if you guys do want to take a look at uh, some tools that Getting the Global has, uh, we have some duty, free duty and tax calculators uh, online at our website and you, a bunch of other tools at gettingtheglobal.org slash tools, all free. Uh, we are going to be launching an expert kind of uh, connect panel where you can find experts that can help you get into different markets around the world and we'll keep you all posted with that. Um, and I will be hopefully showing up, we'll, we'll check it out uh, with the Van Ambassador uh, talking about small, small zero to one marketing plans for companies 
Uh, it's a Sprinter van, video mobile studio, and hopefully at the snow show, we may find our way over there and uh, just hop in, create some content, talk about what your brands are, your unique, unique attributes. Uh, hopefully at that time, you'll already have a channel, whether it's Border X or another platform to sell, so we can actually prove uh, that this makes uh, sense from a sales perspective. But I'm looking forward to doing that, uh, and Marie and I will talk about that a little more, and if you're interested, uh, ping either of us. And with that, I'm gonna send it over to, of course, if you wanna follow us online, we do a bunch of interviews and other things at Getting to Global, uh, YouTube, and there's my LinkedIn, one, two, three, there's Jeff's LinkedIn and email, but we can send this all after the fact. And Maria, do you wanna talk about the trade mission? Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, big thanks to Josh, Jeff, and Nancy for putting this together. Really appreciate you guys taking the time. Um, last September, we did our first educational trade mission to China, where we took 19 members with us. We're going to be doing that again this season with two new trade missions, one in December 8 through 14, and then one again in March 1 through 7. Um, they both have different focuses. One is more urban-based in Beijing. Um, and the other is more resort-based with trips to Chongli and then to Northern China in Jilin. Both are aimed at looking at retail, at meeting with resorts um, and discovering opportunities within the market there. And so we highly encourage members to join us. Um, all the information can be found on our website and you can also um, reach out to me if you want additional information. And one quick clarification, Josh, this is being recorded and so we'll be able to provide this to everybody after the fact, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so people can have Josh and Jeff's um, contact information through the deck. Um, and then I did hear a lot about IP protection. That is going to be a, an additional webinar that we will provide to everybody because that is such an important topic that we need to address. And with that, thank you all for joining us.